excited to bring on a marketing guru. Mr. John Galvin is going to be joining us on the next 24 hours today. He's worked with some of the biggest brands in the world and helped some of the smallest boutique brands as well with marketing, advertising. He's going to give us today a crash course on what top-notch branding really looks like. Welcome to the next 24 hours, where I'm going to give you real information you can really use to transform your life and work one day at a time. I'll be your host, Curtis Zimmerman. So I'm so excited to welcome on to the next 24 hours, John Galvin. Now, John Galvin has taught me so many things in the past about marketing, about branding, about experiential, everything that has to do with that, that I had to bring him onto the show. First, we're going to start with a little bit of his background, but let me just welcome to the show. Hello, John. Welcome to the studio. So glad you're able to join us here live today. How you doing? Doing great. How you doing, Curtis? I am living the dream, my friend, every day. My first question for you is, tell us who John Galvin is and tell us the story that brought you into the career you're currently on. Yeah, so we, we formed a, a company that you're familiar with called Integrate, uh, which at the time, I think was ahead of its time. It was really about um, kind of what I, I and Steve kind of saw as where things were going. It was about kind of bringing best in class resources to every project rather than trying to deal with this traditional agency model. And this is 89 and really about being more media and channel agnostic and being able to really help companies understand brand and positioning and the narrative and then allowing, uh, putting herself into place as a customer and thinking about that being customer centric around the total ecosystem of the brand and relationship to brand customer and associate. So we, our first, you know, as crazy as it is, our first kind of real client was here in Cincinnati as American nursing care. It wasn't too far away from here. And, um, it just, that turned into leveraging, uh, a number of relationships from where we came from at RPA. It turned into repositioning companies such as Toys R Us, big projects for Toys R Us back when they uh, needed a lot of help and, and were uh, willing to actually listen. Um, uh, to Victoria's Secret, to Express. I mean, just, just a lot of people in our backyard that really started finding out that we really have a, a, a fresh, innovative way of approaching problem solving. And uh, But just being able, it really ended up leading to, I mean, a wealth of brands, um, everything from, as I mentioned, Toys R Us and Victoria's Secret and Express to Lowe's to uh, I, probably a hundred of the Fortune 500 brands have been fortunate to have put my hands on and been able allowed to play with, so to speak, uh, across their first 22 years. So everything from you know, emerging startups, we do a lot of startups, and I, I think I've mentioned to you in, in past conversations that you know brands are in three different states. There's either in a startup state where you get to kind of figure everything out from the beginning. They're in a a, a state where they have to be optimized or repositioned and there's a state where they're doing things very well and you're just executing so we very quickly were able to figure that out and talk to our customers about that that life cycle and where they were and how we could help them along that path so that's huge insight and my question is people that are listening right now and are thinking about doing any of those one two or three of the things you just mentioned what would you say are the one or two things, the big mistakes people do when they go and they try to rebrand or they think about marketing? And talk to me right now, if I'm a middle-sized brand, what are the three things most people pay too much for or focus on and it's not that big of a thing anymore, but they're being sold it just because it's an upsell? Give us, give us some of your insight. Sure, yeah, I, I think there's... There's a number of, of things that I've been witness to across the last uh, 33 years. Um, I think some of the biggest challenges and mistakes a lot of companies of all sizes make um, is they're, they, they don't start from a position of, of understanding and, and being authentic to who they are. As a, there's like five things I've always I talk about as, as this foundational pieces of that have to be part of a brand and yes. um, um, they kind of not necessarily this order but close to this order but 
you have to be relevant to your target audience, one. Um, you have to be authentic uh, to yourself, your core purpose, your mission, vision, values, and, and to, you know, to, to who you are. Um, you know, we think about brands as people more than we think about them as businesses, and that's what's important. So relevant, authentic, distinctive amongst your competitors. Distinctive is very important amongst your competition. Very rarely will you see brands that come into a market without competition. It happens now and then, but it's rare. So, uh, and then behind that is uh, defensible. Can you, can you and your company, your people, your products, your services, can you defend your position? Can you, can you pay off that positioning and deliver the goods, so to speak? And then finally, my favorite one that everyone loves to, you know, call me the, you know, the stickler on is consistent, being consistent. How do you communicate consistently so that you build equity and build uh, not only awareness and understanding, but build equity into the brand and can then begin to separate yourselves from other competitors within the marketplace because it's a clear understanding. It's, it's a better offer. It's just it, the consumer has a better relationship, emotional relationship with the brand, et cetera. So I think some of the, the main challenges I see is people don't value um, the elements that have to go into branding. It's, this is irregardless of how much uh, firms or other groups or agencies sell on the pro their process methodology. In my mind, it doesn't matter because if I can get them 85% there in a day, which I know I can versus the 10 weeks or 20 weeks, you know, at a, probably a, a better price, you know, I, I feel good about that because I, you know, I, I actually can deliver because I've done it so many times. Uh, so I think it's understanding the process and understanding that a brand is not just an identity or a logo or colors. It's 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 actually a promise made to um, not only your associates first, but it's also to your target audiences and your guests or your customers. Um, and that's probably one of the third things I've seen is they try to be all things to all people instead of trying to be all things to the right people. So those are three kind of building blocks there as well that – um, if you're able to just step back and, and think about them, I mean, what I've noticed is, um, a lot of people think they can, can assist and help with brand and marketing. Um, everyone has a computer thinks they're a designer. You know, I so, so gladly wish it was a licensed profession because, uh, as I've told you, you know, jokingly before it's just the equivalent when people try to execute in house or they have a firm or someone like me come in and start it and they kind of cut it off mid midstream either on, a, on an intensive day or in the process is like the equivalent of getting uh, LASIK surgery and going to the doctor and having the doctor do the first one, the specialist do your first eye and then sitting up on the bed after the first one saying, I, Hey, I can take it from here. Let's go. Uh, yes. I see that happen very often as well. And I think that, you know, as your title chief experience officer, uh, is just says a lot because so many people to your point have taken a class or watched a webinar or, and now there are social gurus, read a book, and wrote a book, read write a, a book. book, write a book, wrote a book even. Right. Um, and that's very different than the 40 years of real world experience and understanding markets and brands and understanding how you are able to, it's so funny those five things you just mentioned, because obviously I work with lots of different brands as a speaker and I work with them doing in-depth things. And, um, most brands I can think of are missing one of those five things or, right now or, today, or many of them or more. Right. But the number one thing that you can't be missing today to me is being authentic and being completely transparent. If you're, transparent and authentic, your brand will make it in today's economy, in today's marketplace, because I'm able to share that on so many social media. And so, uh, the, the bottom line is your customers, if they love you and they know you're authentic and they know you're passionate and you're completely open, they will do the marketing for you today. A viral video can give you so many likes and so much, I mean, Crocs comes to mind. They were selling out of white shoes and they didn't know why until they saw on social media all the girls wearing their white Crocs underneath their prom dresses. And what they did was they then spoke to that 
and added to that, and next year Crocs weren't sold out in one little area, white Crocs were sold out nationwide. So marketing has changed in that way, listening to the customers, but they were being really authentic to what the customer wanted. It wasn't a bunch of people sitting in a room and then pushing out what they thought the social media, what they thought the marketing would be. They were listening that's absolutely and then right. responding back to that. And that's those five things you talked about that I think are so important. Um, and taking those five things as a starting point, I have to just let everybody who's listening know my logo, my brand, my book, my website, I'll have your fingerprints all over them. And that's where we got to know each other back, you know, early years, days. <laughs> yeah. But years ago when I knew I needed to, and L the business director of the Zimmerman group, the, it knew we had to have strong branding in order to do the things you said, stand out in the marketplace, not just be another run of the mill speaker, those kinds of things. And I remember you did an exercise with us where you got all of our collateral, every business card, every brochure, every single thing that represented us, and you stuck it up on the wall. And then you watched us as we talked through those different things and what they meant to us and why we designed it at that time. And from that, your expertise, I saw shine so much that day. You were able to, just by our facial expressions, just by the feelings and the passion we had about different things of our collateral, you were able to discern, well, here's the color scope. Here's the direction I see you want to go. And you're able to give us something when we saw it, we almost both started bursting into tears because it was so on brand to who we were. Because obviously as a speaker, um, I am the brand. So if you talk about being authentic, you have to have that in spades if it actually represents you. So that's something, the concept of being able to get up in the morning having these amazing rock stars you've assembled uh, in a room all together and then having a company come in and really have all of the stakeholders in the room at the same time, you giving them a morning of kind of what is brand, you know, an exercise of learning about what brands are and all the things you do and then taking them through all the steps that normally take phone calls and independent meetings and all those things doing that all in one day and coming out the other side with something everybody, every stakeholder was part of the process. Every stakeholder feels really good about it. Every stakeholder knows the direction of not only where we're going, but why we're going in that direction is just, I think, brilliant and so excited for you to talk to us a little bit more about that process because I think it is the wave of the future and and I'm just excited to go to one and be part of one and check it out because it sounds amazing to me. Yeah, they're, they're intensive. Uh, they're engaging. They're uh, collaborative. And I, I think what's what's most uh, important about those is, is you're coming out of it with a roadmap and a direction. And uh, it's nothing that, you know, we haven't done in a traditional way that we would you know, in early days, we would take weeks to do these uh, weeks, months, some some firms take years. Um, and I, you know, I just would tell myself, um, it's probably more because they're just filling the rooms and filling meetings with people that really aren't that qualified to be, be in there. And they're trying to do the best job they can of getting buy in. And at the end of the day, um, there, we can get people 85% of the way there um, in, in, in 24 hours. And uh, there's some other things that we have to deliver depending on uh, rights and legal and all that from a registration standpoint that, that takes some time behind it. But yeah, there's, no, there's really no reason you can't do that. And we do that with different types of process, not just brand. We do it with, with innovation sessions, thinking about new products, new services. We do it with everything from experience planning what's what 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 should our guest experience be like or an audit and assessment looking at what this current view of our brand looks like and and looking for those opportunities or potholes that are along the customer journey 
uh, you'll hear a lot of people talk today about data analytics and all this, and that's all fine. I think at the end of the day, that and, and spending a lot of time journey mapping and what we think, a lot of it comes down to basics that we've always done. We've, we've, we've been doing customer experience design since I started back at RPA back in, in, the, um, in the late 80s. We just call it something different. But what it really comes down to is putting, putting yourself and or the customer in the middle of all decision making. They're in control today more than ever with smartphones and access. And they're controlling the narrative. And you've, you've seen a lot of people talk about this over the last several years. And I agree with a lot of it. Um, but th- you, you never learn more than you do by acting as a customer or watching customers actually engage and shop. A lot of companies I see, the other mistakes they make is they make a lot of decisions in, in closed meeting rooms and focus groups. And those really don't really, those, those really don't work that well in my mind, because there's usually an alpha or two in a room and they steer the conversation. And it, I've even seen sessions where CMO or C level or owner gets up in the middle of a session that should be taken a day and two hours in thinks they have the answer and they shut it down and then we, we have to move on. So I haven't seen too many of those make it to the finish line. So, so important. I, there's so many layers to what you just shared. And I want to make sure that everyone that's listening understands that he's talking about you and he's talking about your house. So if you want to know how women are dealing with whatever the issue is or how men are reacting to the latest car, stop thinking about somebody outside of who you know. This is your neighbor. This is your wife. This is your daughter. When you want to talk about customer experience, what do you want when you go to a restaurant? How do you want to check in to a hotel? Uh, What kind of food service and consistency do you want based on the brand you're going to? That's the answer. And I, I totally agree with you. So many people waste so much money, time, and energy trying to fish in a pond that doesn't exist. And they're making it up rather than looking right in front of them in the pond they're currently in. Yeah, and I, and to add to that, um, you know, yes, I've been part of qualitative research and quantitative research and insights, and and all that's great. I think what happens with a lot of established brands is they may be sitting on piles of it, and the first thing we do is to try to see what they already have and how do we how can we activate the insights they may already have and look at it differently. Well, I'll say that one more time: how to activate the insights they already have. So what you're telling me is people spend a lot of money to get a lot of information they never use. They don't use or they don't know how to use it. Ah, okay. That happens a lot. So we, we'll consider that secondary uh, research and insights. And um, and then what we'll look at is if, if, if we get into a longer tail project to really understand a category or why a market's changing or moving or the um, – how Gen Z is going to be interacting with brands versus, you know, like one of the categories that I, I've, I've talked to people about before that is – going through major has to go through major shifts looking at some categories that are i think ripe for kind of reinvention and rethinking and they have been for some time as as the investments you know annuities um mutual funds uh, that kind of have made their a, a lot of their their hay so to speak with boomers and how how are millennials interacting with these brands and businesses and opportunities now? How's Gen Z going to be reacting? Uh, so, because the education of all of those brands and services seems like something dad and mom used to go to a meeting and they'd sit at the kitchen table with a bunch of papers, and that is like painful to the people that you're talking about. So they're not going to take the time. They don't want to have to go through all that. Sure. Therefore, you're saying, wow, we could come up with a new marketing strategy and a way to make it fun and interactive and make them excited about their future. Gamify it. Yeah, gamify it. You look at um, just in one of the startups I'm involved with now, we're just we're raising capital through Facebook and Instagram. You know, think about that, just raising that in, in the public space. But another, I mean, just the, the, that all, it's all changing so fast, which is exciting and it's, it, it's expected, but people don't see it coming sometimes. Some brands don't see it coming. And, you know, what I've always believed is, you know, if you don't spend your time looking out the front window of the car and looking in your rearview mirror, you're never going to get where you're needing to go. And what we really try to help people do is to take them from where they are today to where they need to go tomorrow. Sometimes we'll say where you want to go, but really it's more important 
from a business standpoint of where they need to go. So you think about experiences like if it's working that great or not, the debates out there like a Carvana. I mean, just blowing up the whole way you shop for cars, blowing up the whole way you uh, investment. There's a, uh, I'm a car kind of guy, so everything you might hear might have a lot of car reference. Um, there's a, uh, an investment app called Rally Road where you can invest in rare sports cars. I mean, that a lot of what you're seeing now from an investment standpoint is moving into some more of the mobile social digital realm, which is expected. But uh, but those are all the factors that continue to kind of drive change and drive consumption habits and drive behavior. So the, at the end of the day, um, you have to believe and, and, and put trust in your customer and more importantly, your associates to deliver to those customers. And um, it's so it, hard because the roadmap, so many people still use, especially when they're an established brand, is the road that got them where they are today. And listening to what you just said is, I want you to get you on the right road driving to where your customers not are today, but where they're going to be so I can intercept them sometime in the future. That's exactly They're going to be on this road. Even though right now nobody's on this road, we're going to help drive you because they are going to be there. We know that. And that to me is a big miss for a lot of people. They just want to stay on the road they are because that's where the customers are today. And I love that you gave that as an example of that. I would also say that I just read that Amazon just opened its first store that's a grocery store without any clerks. Sure. So yeah. there's no they've checkout. Test, they've been testing it for quite a while through yes. kind of the Whole Foods purchase and acquisition. Yeah. And and they had a they I think they have 15 or 20 small little convenience stores that are that way. This is the first full blown grocery store that way. You literally go in. You have an app. You pick up the different foods that you want, you put it in your basket, and you walk out of the store, and it charges you. Beautiful. This is beautiful. (laughs) Beautiful, but it changes a billion, multi-billion dollar industry and flips a lot of executives on their head going, oh my gosh, how are we going to retro, you know, there's a million things. So to my point is, there's never been a better time to say, I'm excited that you're on this road and you're established here, but where you need to go in the future, I need to help guide you because I have a feeling it may not be what some of your top people that have been here for 30 years are telling you the path is. So that you bring that to the table better than 99% of the people I've ever met is why I'm so excited and honored that you would come on the show. Because... People need to know people like you exist, and it is so important to invest in these kinds of people in order to take... You mentioned earlier Toys R Us, and the whole thing I talk about so many times is they were so big that they didn't feel they needed to innovate. They didn't feel like they need to have experiential marketing. They didn't feel like they needed to have the kids there and actually get to play while they're there. And they're the one brand that could have and should have delivered that. Oh. More than anybody. So one one great story from the past um, that continues to play itself out today is is how brands, uh, in this case retailers, uh, kind of overreact to to uh, to behavior by a couple customers, but make all their customers pay for it. So in the late '90s, early 2000s, we had a great opportunity to work as a part of a joint development team at Integrate to uh, help redevelop the entire Toys R Us experience, which some of you remember was, I would say, horrific at best. It was they would they they forced you to kind of shop the store and thought they had one or two customer groups, and they all went to they they shopped every every aisle, every category, and then came to purchase with a smile and left happy. Not the case. <laughs> so. Uh, one particular category, the R Zone, which was uh, gaming and kind of emerging technology that was blowing up at the time, which was Nintendo and PlayStation. And and what I, when we went to the store and we're doing our audits across uh, multiple markets, I just was arrested by what I saw in this category. And I still have this picture today. And I'll, uh, anybody wants to see it, you can see it on our, our LinkedIn or I can send it to you because it's it, it, it tells the entire story. So 2% of their customers were stealing. And they made 100% of their customers pay for those 
so they what they did is in that category, which we knew from talking to customers and being consumers of that type of product ourselves, it's a try before you buy. I want to put it. I want to try this Nintendo Station. I want to try some of these games and actually see how it goes and which one has better graphics and stuff. But not in this case. You had to go. You went to that aisle. And it, they were sitting in glass cases like you're in a museum and locked. You had to find an associate, which was never available. Come unlock it. And almost like the old service merchandise experience where you didn't even get to open it. You had to take it to the checkout and just buy it. Wow. So what we did just to kind of condense, you know, a lot of a lot of intense research and work on this is we embedded security. We work with manufacturers to create these these trial stations with the, with the big screens and, and the games. And, uh, it just exploded that category on that alone. Theft went down 50% to 1% right away. And, um, hardware and software or gaming sales just jumped out of the roof. Some stores as much as a hundred, 200% in some categories right away. So it's interesting for me because I think there are a lot of brands that are listening and a lot of people that are in marketing and advertising and all of these things. And my question for them is I want them to go back to their customers and say, what are we locking up right now? What are we not sharing? What's our brand promise we're not delivering? Because two or three or even 6% of some social media post or from something that happened, we're taking that and we're changing our culture. We're changing our style. We're changing everything. And that that's not the way to go because you want to have a bigger reach. And that's what I love about what you bring to the table is you're able to see those things. And to you, it's so blatant. And then here's the path to get you to success. And I would just say, you've helped me in my own career do that. And I've seen you do that with so many other people. And if somebody wants to find out more about John Galvin and more about uh, what you do, how would, they, how would they reach out to you? How would they find you? Easiest way is to um, reach out through our website, uh, the number 779partners.com. Um, we're on social media. Uh, as well, I'm mostly on, on LinkedIn, and uh, and it, it won't, won't be hard to find me directly if they need to reach me from there as well. And seven so. nine partners, uh, when I hear that name, I assume that's you, and then like seven to nine other people that you work <laughs> with, or you know, I don't know what the name means. I'm just asking. It's what a funny does story. That... It's a simple story because it's it's my home studio where I started it is is uh, 79 East Russell Street in Columbus. But yeah, there could be a bigger story there if we really want to bake it. But now with all 33 years plus of relationships, I can bring in the best people in the world, like you or a number of people I've worked with in the past that have a critical expertise, passion, and understanding of, and, and they have to have a couple things that, that align to what we do, which is you know, passion for customer experience, understanding the value of brand, and, and a desire to help people move from where they are today to where they want to go next. So I look at us more as change agents than we are a design firm or a marketing agency. We really are helping people move from where they are, get unstuck, helping them go from, from where they are to where they need to go next. And, um, wow. I love that. I can't thank you enough for being with us today and sharing your insights and sharing some of the things that people maybe haven't thought of or things that maybe they're doing incorrectly or helping them not waste their money on old branding and old ways of doing things with the current market we're in. So thank you so much, John, for joining us on the next 24 hours. I appreciate you and I hope that you have an amazing 2020. Thanks for having me, Curtis. My favorite part of the podcast, the 24-hour challenge. I want you to come up with your family. I want you to come up with your team. I want you to come up with a group of whoever that talks about a brand. And, And we've talked about this in the past and that you yourself are also a brand. And how, if you were going to put your own self up on a giant wall, how would you look in different settings? How do you dress every day? What's the brand promise you bring? What kind of language do you use every day? And is it truly what you want to produce and push out into the world? I want you to do that in the next 24 hours. I don't say if uh, if you do it on a piece of paper where you write different attributes about you, you write different things you bring to relationships, and then look at that piece of paper and really think about, hmm, is this the brand I really want to be? 
And if you are working at a company that it represents a brand, set up a wall, put it three different categories, and allow those people through the week to come up and put things up on that wall. At the end of the week, everyone comes together and sees what your brand really looks like. That's the 24-hour challenge. Go out and, of course, live your dream by helping others live their dream. Hey, everybody, I wanted to thank you so much for listening. And I have a, a workbook that is all about script writing. It's a, how to write a new script. It's normally $15 on my website. I want to offer it to you today for free. Just go to curtiszimmerman.com forward slash new script, and you'll be able to download that as a free gift. I hope you enjoy it, and I hope you keep listening to the next 24 hours.